good day. It's Dr. Douglas Pernikoff and my wonderful co-host, Miss Cindy Vickers. And we're from Dr. Doug's All Things Animal radio show. And we're very excited to uh, introduce our very special guest today, Dr. Ellen Derenfeld, who is very unusually represented as a comparative animal nutritionist. So uh, I've known Ellen for a number of years, and she has an amazing and interesting background because she's worked mostly with out of the ordinary, non-domestic, zoologic, and other, and domestic species as a nutritionist. But Ellen, why don't you uh, give us a short introduction? What the heck got you into this path? I mean, did you consider other things like veterinary medicine, or was it nutrition all the way, and then somehow the critters were the way to go? Well, that's a good question, Doug. My, <laughs> my, my, father, one. <laughs> my father is actually a large animal veterinarian. Oh, I didn't know practitioner, that. Practitioner, and I grew up in that family. Um, so I have an appreciation for veterinary medicine, but I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do mm -hmm. because I'd rather keep animals healthy mm -hmm. than fix them once they're sick. And I know that nutrition is one of those basic sciences, sciences uh -huh. that uh, leads to good health. That's a good idea. And, and I also realized that vets didn't get a lot of nutrition training. No, they don't. Yeah. And then the other so, question is, yeah. how did you get directed into something so unusual? Yes. Because you could have been a human nutritionist, had a traditional job. Okay. Well, when I, I was uh, at undergrad at Iowa State mm -hmm. and started in fishers and wildlife biology oh, because okay. I always liked the wildlife side of things. We had unusual pets. We had an alligator once. Mm -hmm. We had the, the requisite snakes and tadpoles, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, no, well, requisite. No, not in everybody's <laughs> family is that requisite, but I guess if your father's it wasn't a mine. Dad of large animals, right. So in yeah, this so. world of three people, mm -hmm. two outnumber one, then it's requisite. I just yes. wanted to oh, clear that up. Fair enough. Carry okay. on. Raccoons, <laughs> opossums, skunks, things like that. So three we, turtle so we, doves and a partridge in a pear yeah, tree. So I appreciated those aspects, and as well as dogs and cats. We had the, the, the normal pets as well. Um, but I realized early on, well, after, after about two years when we had to get internships, they said, okay, yeah, but you probably have to have at least a master's and, and probably a PhD if you really want to work with animals. Otherwise, you're just going to be like a park ranger writing tickets or something, fishing <laughs> licenses. I went, oh my God, I got to find a different major. Right. So I shifted to animal agriculture and uh, animal nutrition is one of the specialties in animal science. And at that time, then I realized there wasn't really an, a field of wildlife nutrition that was being That's right. um, very well developed. And so I was able to combine the interests and the science and went to graduate school anyway. <laughs> so were you, you were probably one of the first generation zoologic nutritionists. Yeah. Well, wait, let's clarify that. So my understanding is that you have been a nutritionist for a zoo or more than one zoo, I don't know. But I wouldn't necessarily call that wildlife. So were, or, or, is it really both? That is like, you know, well, there's ducks. An, there's and indigenous wildlife, which are to our area. There's uh, nationally indigenous, would be throughout the U.S., but then anything that's outside is non domestic or wild. Um, if non domestic, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's wildlife. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if it's an elephant, that, that's, that we're, it's we're in wildlife. There, yeah, it's a hippo. Okay, <laughs> they're really wild. That would be wild. They will eat you up. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I'm, I, I like to think of myself as one of the grandmothers of zoo nutrition, if you will. What are you, about 89? <laughs> yeah, <No. laughs> almost. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there were a couple of, of nutrition programs in zoos mm -hmm. when I was in graduate school, and a lot of you know, separate studies that had been published on different aspects of nutrition, but there were very few nutrition positions in zoos. And I was very fortunate right out of graduate school to be hired by the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York, based at the Bronx Zoo, and manage their nutrition program. Is so, that changed? Is it different now? Like, do, well, there's is, how many, is there a board certification program for it? or There still isn't. Uh, th there's no specific qualification set up there are many more positions now that's what i'm wondering in, is it become more nutrition. mainstream you know too um yes and no it went up uh, there there was kind of a peak of about two dozen of us out of the 200 or more accredited zoos in the states 
and uh, now it's dropped back uh, slightly. So if you don't have somebody who, who you consult or who works at the zoo, how do, how do the people who work there know really what is the best thing to feed the animals? I can, oh, Doug I raised can his start, hand. I can yeah. start to answer that because I had that dilemma mm -hmm. uh, at the Fort Rizzo and at the St. Louis Zoo and San Antonio. Everywhere I worked, in fact, were kind of the time when Ellen was developing as a professional. And then, uh, so we didn't have that kind of support. So a lot of it, unfortunately, had to do with, first of all, um, familiarity uh, from people that had been in the zoo world doing it for years and probably making mistakes along the way and endangering animals. But that's the, what we had to do. And then the other part of it is that you extrapolate from domestic uh, medicine and, and husbandry, of course. But I wanted to ask Ellen a really quick question. When I started learning about birds and reptiles, I was kind of a first, first and a half generation zoo veterinarian. And at that time, you know, we would learn, unfortunately, we'd go to a seminar and it was, this animal died and we're looking backwards yes. to find what might have happened. And it wasn't until we had a whole collective uh, body of information that allowed us to look at animals and say, now we can go forward and prevent these diseases once we understood them. Now that's an ever, ever changing and ever dynamic kind of process because we bring in new species, we only see so few, a, a number of a given species, so we don't have the population N number for research that you get in a lot of uh, human studies or even domestic pet studies. Is mm -hmm. that right? Oh yeah. In fact, um, if you look at some of the older surveys from the veterinary literature, sometimes more than 50% of the causes of death were nutrition related. That has gone down considerably in more recent years. That makes sense yes, to me. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes perfect sense yeah. to me. Yeah. Uh, so I can't imagine, like, well, so I'd like you to describe what that means. I think, you know, I'd like to hear about other things that you did, but I think the idea of just, for example, being a nutritionist for just a zoo, that alone seems to be completely overwhelming. So I used to actually sell food for people, you know, and, and I would go to, like one of my clients was a hotel, and their orders are huge. Do you have to like order the food? Like where does the food come from? And how do you, do, I mean, do you literally have to be like, okay, we're gonna order nine bales of grass and we need oats and we need- Five pounds berry. of smelt. We need, oh, you need the- <laughs> Frozen baby, smelt. The baby pinks, right? Those yes. are the baby mice. mice? So, yeah. do, are you impressed I knew that? I am. Yeah. yeah, so like, how, what does that look like? Yeah, so the, the menu uh, in any um, zoo collection is quite varied, and as you can imagine. So you actually have to be familiar with foodstuffs in the human food industry. So you're working with produce, uh, fruits and vegetables that you would get from the same suppliers mm -hmm. um, as for human foods and restaurants. Oh my God, I should have been my client. I would have been. <laughs> you could have been a big client. Yes. <laughs> but also you've got the whole prey. Mm -hmm. So it could be insects, it could be rodents, uh, it could be other aspects of whole prey. You've got hay, fresh grasses or fresh browses, like limbs of trees, mm -hmm. and you've got commercial foods. Yeah. So that, and fish is a whole nother, uh, fish and frozen meat products. So there's many different categories that one has to be familiar with. So there's a place where you can source things, like, and I think when you say the whole prey, or the whole, what did, what's the Whole word prey. Here? The whole prey is um, often live, right? It can be. It's, or frozen. It could be, oh. or fr <laughs> frozen. <laughs> and there is a place where you can source that, yes. obviously. Probably there's a company that does that. There's a lot of companies that do that, yeah, actually. Yeah, interesting. So and, the, and, and they deal with the hobby industry as well. Yeah. The hobbyists yeah, that, that yeah. have... Yeah, well, and it's interesting because I, I think I brought this up on another show where we were talking about wildlife, but, you know, there's always this big thing about you shouldn't have exotic animals. But in certain animal groupings like reptiles and avian species in particular and fishes, a lot of the husbandry in, was developed in private homes and private sector, and then it came to the zoo world. So I have a different regard. i have kind of like on the fence. I see both sides of the benefit. But the big question I want to ask and talk about here is, I love form and function, okay? I, I just, Stephen Gould, Jay Gould, and a number of other people that write. So this is all about how an animal is developed to live in a certain micro or uh, ecological niche that it lives in, and how can it survive? And one of the biggest areas to worry about is uh, food. How you grab the food, how you access the food, how you begin to process it, how the body processes it. So 
And we're talking about um, form function, meaning physiology, anatomy, and biochemistry. And talk about a diverse uh, collection of information you have to get familiar with. And I had the same problem as a zoo veterinarian. Everything's a little different, and you can extrapolate as much, but certain things have to be formulated, actions, procedures, whatever, for a specific group. So what was your challenge there? I mean, gosh. Yeah, so you do, you, you work with historical records, but often uh, it's not recorded what didn't work. So sometimes you can make the same mistakes that people knew about from the past. Hmm. But this is why we've got to keep writing down records and sharing them with other people. So working with historical records in developing a diet, working with the animal's ecology, and understanding how it fits into its habitat, another one. And one of my big uh, research aspects over my career has been looking at the composition of native foods eaten by these animals because we can often duplicate the nutrients using available substitutes. We can't often duplicate the exact ingredients. And I think that I... Or the I, form of the food. I also yes. wonder, though, you know, as time goes on, it's sort of like, you know, mother's milk. People thought, well, we'll just, we can make formula that, that replicates it um, extremely well. And then, you know, years, every few years, they're like, example. oh, here's something else that we discovered that's in it that we didn't know was in it. And I, it has to be the same. I'm and thinking. it was hell to have a whole bunch of women just sitting there ready to provide milk, you know, just for the I, you know, commercial we're, marketplace. We're just <laughs> sailing along. It's just lovely the way it's happening. And then he had to jump right in. <laughs> Actually, that's really, that, that's a really interesting comment that you had about milk because there was a paper just published out of Japan last year looking at elephant milk composition. And they found the highest levels of glucosamine in elephant milk. Now, this makes sense because there's a lot of pressure on joints right. in, in yeah. a heavy animal like that. And it's nothing that had ever been documented in milks before. Wow. So I, under, I also just wonder if you um, if it makes a difference, I, I would imagine it, I don't know if it does or not. Okay, my question is, if an animal usually has to go up to a tree limb and pick something from a tree that they have to climb in order to get the whatever they're trying to eat the fruit. If you don't present it in that way, does it make a difference? I mean, does it affect the way they digest it or their um, interest in eating it or does anybody know? <laughs> Mostly what it affects is their calorie output. Mm -hmm. So the activity patterns in nature are very different than the activity patterns in in captivity mm -hmm. often we have often we have obesity issues right and so making the habitats in a zoo as naturalistic as possible to duplicate those behaviors is really important from a health perspective mm -hmm. and the nutrition component comes into that there's another interesting aspect of that um, how do certain animals evolve why did bats evolve okay with wings or wing type function. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. the reason they did was because they could compete then with other animals that could climb. They could come out to the very tips where the fruit fruiting of the trees existed and feed off the flowers or whatever it was, the nectar or the fruits. And that was their way of adapting. And I think that's very interesting because, you know, it, if you may not believe in evolution, but I do, and, and it just seems like it's so interesting to see, like the last thing you said, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, does the glucosamine evolve? Or how did, you know, we just learned and made a name to it and called it glucosamine, but someone, a higher order or something, developed and said, hey, this elephant's going to need glucosamine because he's carrying a lot of weight. How does that kind of stuff happen? It's it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Do do um, do people like you ever see if some of the is it does it work that the things that you find out get transferred to humans? For example, that you you know that that there's so much glucosamine in an elephant's milk. Does then any do, do people who work in human nutrition go? So we want to see if that glucosamine would um, be viable for a human. One example of that that I can uh, remember it was a research collaboration we did with a university group in Canada looking at the fiber content of foods eaten by gorillas in the wild. And gorillas don't get colon cancer to the same extent, well, they, it's never been documented in gorillas. And so actually we were looking at the fiber levels and the fiber types, and it was a human nutrition group that was interested in that. They were the first authors on this and, and extrapolating that as fiber levels that could help with human health. Yeah, that's neat. And yeah, I mean, there's extrapolation back and forth. If we're the veterinary 
or the animal nutritionists, we're looking for ways to pull from that knowledge base. And they are always using, I mean, most of research started with hu with animal models for human use, right? So, so are most human nutritionists PhDs? I don't think well, so, not necessarily, right? Uh, there's probably a big there's, group of them. There's yeah. a degree. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's You're a thinking of clinical nutritionists and, and um, at hospitals and stuff, and they may only go up to the master's level, mm -hmm. or they might even be some subordinate certifications. I don't know. but Well, there's dietitians, registered dietitians, dietitians right. and mm -hmm. dietetics is another critical aspect, and that's actually getting the nutrients into food forms that are palatable, palatable. and will meet the, the clinical needs of the that's patient, right. Yeah. We're going to take, uh, it's really interesting, it's a great discussion. We're going to take just a moment. It's Dr. Doug Pernerkoff of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show with my co-host Cindy Vickers and our wonderful guest, Dr. Ellen Dierenfeld, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. This is Dr. Doug Pernikoff. We're back for segment two. We're visiting with a very, very special guest, uh, and that's Dr. Ellen Derenfeld. And I think you were just talking with Cindy Vickers, our co-host, about some interesting it's just, topics. Well, we can't say. I don't even think 70% of what we just said off the air. I mean, it's just unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't be on the air if we can't talked hear about what happens yeah. when it's not on the air. Yeah. So what are you saying? Is it my turn? No, no, I can. I, I have, have lots of questions. Oh, I have, I have several here also. Go ahead, I'd like girl. To ask. Um, well, apparently, there's a story about elephant teeth. What, what is the connection between elephants' lives or longevity and their teeth? Is there a connection? And do you know about this, Ellen? <laughs> oh, sure. This is actually not my <laughs> question. Elephants have a, a, a unique tooth. Uh, Evo evo evolutionary pattern really <laughs> that their teeth uh, come in from the back and then move forward Ooh. so there's a number of sets seven i, I, think, I it's think it's six or seven six yeah. or seven sets and as you they mean complete sets of teeth well yeah. mol big large molars and then they move forward as they wear down then they'll actually wear out and the next ones will take over the chewing function wow. and ultimately as the last one wears down the animal can no longer chew the food and get any nutrition out of it, and that's uh, associated with their Death. demise. Yeah. So, you, but it essentially kind of goes that way, I'm guessing. Like, it's, yeah. if they live, how long does well, an elephant live? Well, I mean, it really depends. Well, but, give me, know, like, the, I would the say average. 70, 80 years. It's probably is 70 or 80, if, so a, like, if they can. But that's about the time that the the, the teeth would wear. To it probably eat. also depends somewhat on the food they're if they eating brush through their and life. Floss. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reality is, this goes back to my point about form and function. You know, if you look and you're a comparative physiologist or an anatomist, an anatomist then you're going to look and say, okay, well, this animal, if I see a skull in the woods, I can almost tell you if it's a carnivore or if it's an omnivore. You know, or what, you know, speed, if it's a gramivore, it might be tougher to, to differentiate the smaller differentiations. But basically, it's a way to treat how does your, how do your teeth work? How does your tongue work? How does your, do you have a crop, a distension of the esophagus, or you just have a straight tube? How is the stomach formulated and anatomically exist? One, single, multiple, and then on and down the, the cecum. Uh, Seekum, we call the appendix. Where are we going with this, Doug? What I'm trying to say is that <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting because uh -oh. <laughs> each anatomy teaches you what that animal's doing in its natural history and its, it's life. Like dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah you can is. study that. Uh, Ellen, take it away. Well, from it, the more the more complex the anatomy of the digestive tract, the more complex chemically the foods that these animals can deal with. That's interesting. And so high fiber foods that need to be broken down by bacteria in the gut require some chamber for the bacteria to live in, either the fore stomach or the hind gut. Which brings me to what is your favorite species to work with? I know there's a connection here. Okay, I, I actually I I don't really have a favorite species, but if I had to pick a group but that you don't my, love so much, it's like, the the ones I don't find as exciting are ruminant animals. Okay, so. time out. This is when I said ruminant. I thought that's when you're looking through your drawer, drawers for the, you know, the <laughs> you're ruminating the thing for, you can't find, and right. that's not so. Okay, you're, like so, she said, you're churning and turning. So it's the churners? So I mean, can, can anim, herbivore, herbivorous animals that have a foregut 
their stomach is adapted for dealing with plants and one segment of that stomach is called the rumen. So that's a big storage vat. And they starts, chew, they, they'll chew their it's... food, mm -hmm. bring it down to the rumen, regurgitate it, rechew it, regurg uh, re-swallow, regurgitate. So the whole rumination process is the regurgitation, rechewing, re-swallowing process to break it down. Does it mix with chemicals in there or just mm. chewing? It, it okay. mixes with your saliva. Okay. So there's chemicals in the saliva, mm -hmm. but what is the most important for those animals is the microbes, the bacteria mm -hmm. in that fore stomach. And this is before the acid stomach. Like we have an acid stomach. Mm -hmm. So the plant fibers start getting broken down by those bacteria. And then if there's things left, fats and proteins, they can get broken down by the digestive processes that we're more familiar with with humans. Okay. Or, or in carnivores. Intestine. And the, uh, the teeth again, and she, this goes back to the elephant point, but the whole point is they are, who is that? That's the elephant. <laughs> they masticate, uh, they have to process. <laughs> Chew, chew. <laughs> that's a that's a good word. I know what the word means. <laughs> okay, thank Cindy you. Cindy was so blushing, much. and I said, "Everybody masticates, <laughs> so it's not a problem." <laughs> so, it's just how private you are. Oh, but it's anyway, the show over yet? I know. <laughs> so they have to process that straw and hay or, or branch material. Rhinos too eat the mm -hmm. They eat thorns and stuff. You go, how do they eat? <laughs> you know. And carnivores, in fact, they their whole idea is to grab tear and swallow and then they go sit someplace and digest the acid digestion to start but it's different with every group of animals okay so why why are the ruminators not your favorite is that, is um, that right the ruminators r r ruminants the ruminants yeah. the ruminants everybody like ruminators. Listen up. Get sounds like a science fiction the, the terminator ruminants okay so know. ruminants I, I, and it's a room that it's in literally like the rumen. rum it's a segment of the gut, the gut so there's four different sections of the the stomach but it's r-u-m room r-u-m-e-n e, rumen. rumen it's okay it goes into the rumen okay yes. i just and i need to know r-u-m-i-n-a-n-t for the noun ruminant yeah I, okay, I'm, so I'm I prefer non-ruminant herbivores. Like, For example? Uh, horses. horses. So they're hindgut fermenters, or koalas, or pandas, or um, elephants and rhinos. I guess there's not as many people working with those groups of animals. So we don't know as much about them. We know a lot about ruminant nutrition because cows and sheep and goats are all ruminants. And so there's a lot more ruminant nutritionists mm -hmm. Because the been world. domesticated for so, so long. So is, is that why you, per, it's, it doesn't really have anything to do with the, um, the function itself. of their stomach. It's just that you feel like it's just more interesting to you to, to be with the non-ruminants. Yes, it's more interesting. And they, they actually don't, their poop doesn't smell as bad. <laughs> there you go. That, that sums it up. There's a good reason. Yeah. Well, uh, one more point that I find really interesting is that young ruminants are almost like monogastric or seeing it's single stomach animals and they convert as they evolve, develop mm -hmm. so they have to start out like a different animal okay i just i need to interrupt for just one second before sure. we go any farther and i'd like to say to anybody who's listening be sure before the show starts you get a pen and mm -hmm. get a piece of paper so you can write down these words because there's a lot of vocabulary that gets introduced in yes, the show and yes. then we'll either explain it or you can look it up like mastication but i think it's very important <laughs> I, yeah four people knew what that was but <laughs> yeah but gastric bypass or whatever you said yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. okay carry on I forget what I, I was saying but, but it is gastric <laughs> bypass it is actually. yeah yeah actually very good so, oh wow <laughs> just and it just came to me well you're so intuitive oh, that's I'm what I love even about you I'm not even a veterinarian it's good grief so let me ask you something mm -hmm. um I want to hear something that you found very difficult in your do you have any uh, we like to hear stories so what would be one good story of like wow you get into this job and you go oh my gosh there's a new problem every day how do you approach the process of solving these problems for a different species yeah and by good we really mean not good we mean like down and dirty this was awful i was just ready to do something oh, goodness. not good uh, i mean usually um the priority when you're dealing with these species um is a medical issue a, an emergency type issue where you've got to deal with it now Often animals are just, they may not be optimal, but they're hanging in there. But if something is going downhill and there's a nutrition component, then that becomes your priority issue. So I can think of two um, species for which I had 
some serious issues. Um, one was when we first brought in uh, what's called a proboscis monkey. They've got a very large nose. And this is like a... Write that down. <laughs> proboscis. I know. I knew that one, though. <laughs> so they look like Jimmy Durante. The males mm -hmm. look like Jimmy Durante noses. I mean, they're very From big. Indonesia. Yeah, from Southeast Asia. So mm. they have a, they're almost like a ruminant monkey. So they have a foregut fermentation. They have a big a saccular stomach that houses bacteria to break down the leaves they eat. And we were one of the first groups to bring them into captivity. This is in, in uh, the Bronx, New York? When I was in okay. the Bronx Zoo. And we had three animals there. And one was going downhill really badly. And we, ulti we ultimately saved its life by calling a... Um, botanical garden in Florida and having them send up mangrove leaves which was their natural food from the wild and as soon as this animal saw it he perked up started eating Aww. and came back that's neat yeah. and you know there was another story when I was in the zoo world all of a sudden eucalyptus trees were everywhere and I think I, I think what it was was um, did, were the eucalyptus in California were they there or was that planted on behalf, because they're fast growing and all that, but were they planted to support the zoo world? Um, eucalyptus trees were brought in actually on the west coast um, by the, I believe the railroad industry, mm. because the wood was used for rail car um, manufacture. And they grow so fast. And they fast. grow rapidly, yeah. and, and they're, they're used worldwide when they're trying to put forests back in place. Uh -huh. It may not be the optimal tree for uh -huh. the environment, but it's getting planted worldwide when they're taking out forests. So, yeah, so if it's a plant that is not uh, our natural habitat, let's say in St. Louis, do you, really do those things have to be shipped in or you know, Sometimes. flown in? And we try, this is why we look at the chemistry of plants in the wild and that I worked with a lot of field biologists to, to so collect this so we could understand what the chemistry was and how we could pot potentially duplicate it okay. with available food So not probably a fair question, but in a zoo, let's say the size of the St. Louis Zoo, what would a budget be? Oh my gosh, food. that's a good question. Yeah, she, yeah. Oh, we never said, but you never told him your history besides the Wildlife Conservation Society. Oh, yeah. She was the first nutritionist zoo, at, uh, not the first? Nope, nope, there was one before me. Was there really? Mm -hmm. But she was the prominent St. <laughs> Louis best, Zoo our favorite. nutritionist. <laughs> uh, so before we answer that question, we're going to take another quick break. And again, I want to thank uh, Ellen for being here and Cindy always for being here and we'll be back in just a moment and answer your second part of the question. Thank you. Fresh air. Times Square. You are my wife. Goodbye city life. Green acres we are there. Welcome back again. This is Dr. Doug Pernikoff, Cindy Vickers, and Dr. Ellen Dierenfeld, who's our comparative animal nutritionist, has an amazing history working not only at the Bronx Zoo, but also at the St. Louis Zoo. Then she worked for a large company called Novus, which is a food product development for animals, right, mostly? They make feed ingredients. Feed ingredients. And now she's a free-ranging consultant, <laughs> goes all over the world. She's involved in continued research and diet development and uh, she's just amazing lots of information okay she's got a weird husband who collects turtles but that's okay <laughs> besides that we're okay so do you right yeah i collect turtles too okay. so i'm weird too yeah we could bring him on sometime yeah we'd yeah. love to <laughs> the turtle man so the last thing we started to ask was about budgets and zoos mm -hmm. and we realized it probably isn't appropriate to Tell anyone that the St. Louis Zoo probably spends a million dollars a year on on animal food. No, actually, probably more. Probably more. I but we don't know that. that. We don't saying. know what the actual number well, we is. We want them to be well fed, though. We're having oh, a fabulous absolutely. zoo. We want the animals to be cared well, for. Well, but I mean, the things you have to worry about, Ellen, you can verify or validate this is, you know, the hay has to be a certain quality. Absolutely. The, you know, and it's seasonal and it you, you you're at the mercy of the local providers typically the fish i remember our new i used to be in charge of the nutrition center at the fort at the fort worth zoo and our people were constantly chasing different fishes for different needs and which is good is is a mackerel good today is haddock good and then i was going to mention also um even when you talked uh, cindy earlier about processing foods one of the, i remember one of the earliest problems that we had in zoos 
uh, had to do with the horse meat that was laden with extra amounts of estrogens, and it was impacting the reproductive capabilities of the big cats. Is that right? The white tigers and stuff, or am I off? I I think some of that has been um, kind of disproven, disproven okay, since good. then. But but there's certainly phytoestrogens in plants that do affect herbivores more so than carnivores. You mean their hormonal finding, levels? And it, it's really, yeah, it's interesting because we're finding that even in herbivores that eat plants for a living, some types of the plants that we're using are potentially impacting reproductive outputs. Because they're capabilities. contaminated or it's just the plant? No, it's just, it's just different. than affects maybe. the biochemistry mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that becomes a problem because we have to be self-sustaining in the zoo world because a lot of species are not allowed to be extracted from their wild space anymore. And then the other problem is if we can't get them to reproduce, we can't get the population stabilized. If we reproduce too much, we get too much of a genetic representation and then we don't want them reproducing. It's, I mean, the management is, has to be so fine-tuned that people don't realize that. Which is why nutrition is really an interesting discipline because it interfaces with all these other disciplines. It interfaces directly with reproduction, interfaces with behavior, Interfaces with immune function and health and thereby. health and so I mean this is this is the area that we really need to be focusing on now is how those disciplines interface because we've got good reproductive physiologists with a lot of exotic species we've got good nutritionists but we need to be looking at the interactions of those two disciplines. Well, to this me. is just related, but uh, you, you you yourself said that or both of you um, said that veterinarians really don't get very much uh, mm -mm. nutritional education, so they have to seek it out on their own. So I would think that if that still is the case, which I believe that it is, it's difficult to make your case with with somebody who's, that's just not their focus, is, is how important nutrition is, because they might be thinking, they're just a little bit more allopathic, and they're thinking like, here's the medicine to treat this problem that's already happened. And I, it seems like the nutritionists are really thinking way, are way in front of that thinking. We're trying to get, it's trying changing to, to not. Yeah. It, yeah, I think that it yeah. probably is changing, but I would think as the nutritionist, it would be uh, just to have that battle of saying, now I have all this work to sort of prove to you that the nutrition impacts their for example, and, reproductive know, health. That's very interesting because, Ellen, you've told me little side stories in our visits together about how you had to demonstrate to someone in maybe the health area, hey, this is really a nutritional problem. You need to look at least nutrition as part of the issue. And that's a, is that a challenge for you all the time is to sell your story to the, to the managers? I mean, more and more people are recognizing the value of nutrition, even in human nutrition. 20 years ago, it, it wasn't that big of a deal, and now it is at yeah. all levels. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're actually looking at how important the diet is to even the gut microbes mm -hmm. that support the health of the gut mm -hmm. itself. And so as, as it evolves in humans, it's, it's getting more and more accepted in many of these other species that we work with. Well, when we had Gail on, who's a nutritionist, who's mm -hmm. a dog and cat nutritionist, she was saying her research is, has gotten actually just fine-tuned, really, to like gut health and probiotics and um, microbes in the guts of, of cats and dogs. And I mean, that just, that study, which is pretty small, is, is a great, great it's big small part of her research. Right, but it's, it's a big Yeah, there's impact. so much to study, right. yeah. And we're just talking about, about that one little well, thing. And she was saying that the research for the dogs and cats is, is pretty much uh, more advanced than the research even for, for people. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. you know, you have to realize that in a case like that, let's take any of the big uh, pet food manufacturers, they have to find ways to differentiate themselves from the competitor. Mm -hmm. So one way to do that is to find something, oh, this is great for skin, or this mm -hmm. is great for this or that, because they want to be able to make a product that not only sells and has functionality, but makes them unique. Yeah. So And then they all jump on. But like, Yeah, that's marketing also. Yeah, that's marketing and sales. But it comes, you know, there's a science field that wants to help that and develop, but it always has to have, in those kind of manufactured foods, it has to have a profit motive, a value plus 
to the company. Otherwise, they're not going to put the money into the studies. So let's say I don't know if you, if what your thought is on this, but is there like one group of animals that you're these are the most difficult animals, bugs, whatever, to get a handle on what is their nutrition? Actually, right now we're seeing the most problems with what are called the browsing species. So it's animals that eat plants, and it could be ruminants or non-ruminants, but not grasses. So they're not grazers. A grazer, we can feed grass and hay, grass hay too, and they do fine. But the browsers that eat a lot of trees, well, there's different kinds of browsers. Some browsers eat woody parts of the plants, like the bark and the, mm -hmm. and the twigs. Some browsers eat the leaves, and some browsers eat uh, fruits. Mm -hmm. So chemically, these are very different foodstuffs, and you can't lump them all into one category. And so we're seeing a lot of health problems with browsers in general. Can, can, do you know like uh, an example of some animals that are browsers? Like so, uh, like safari animals, I'm thinking. Giraffe, giraffe's a browser. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, okapi, a relative of the giraffe, is a browser. Um, there well, are, although he lives in the land, he learns to feed in um, uh, some of the other antelope as well. Mm -hmm. Rather than graze, they reach up and stand up and, mm -hmm. and, and eat the leaves. And eat the leaves. And the chemical and physical features of the plants they're eating are very different than the domestic plants that we're using as substitutes sometimes. Because the leaf is not just a leaf. It's uh, got to be that leaf. Well, yeah, there's some are brittle, some are soft. And the tooth structure of a grazer is tall and sharp, whereas the tooth structure of a browser is flatter for crushing rather than biting off. And I bet we, at, at, I bet at the early stages of this, we would have assumed that a garanook, which is an interesting kind of uh, browsing uh, antelope, um, stands up as a long neck. But I bet initially we assumed we had a ruminant and we had a. Uh, uh, a herbivore and we had a carnivore and kind of that kind of thing and now we learn that there's so much differentiation between and we can partition out very specialized feeders okay eat animals that eat a certain way even in with the scope of birds let's say um, it's a broad collection of animals and species and depend on where they live on their ecological niche they're going to eat very unique and specialized foods which again will define their anatomy, their physiology, and their biochemistry. Just think of a carnivore like an eagle is going to be different than a duck that's going to be grazing on different water plants and bugs and stuff like that. Is that correct? Well, absolutely. And with birds, really, our models that we know the most about are domestic poultry. So you've got grain eating or omnivorous poultry, you've got geese that are more grazers. But you don't Geese have... Geese are grazers? Yes. Yeah. yeah. They have a hindgut for fermenting that plant material, which is why you see so much uh, green uh, deposits in your yard when the geese come through. Because they're eating the grasses. <laughs> and so I would never, you know, at first blush, I would never think duck carnivore. Did you say ducks are carnivores? Some no, are. no. Some, some oh, are. Well, yeah, there, I guess they could. There are there's fish-eating ducks. Yeah, that would be a there, carnivore. Yeah, and right. there are... Um, grazing ducks. So even within the ducks, there's a whole range well, that we have to look at. Is some of the grazing done like on water-based plants? Yes. I mean, okay, mm -hmm. because I've, I'm yeah. thinking you're like, thinking ranges. Yeah. And yeah. Stuff yeah. Like that. Right. Now they're eating duckweed, yeah. like skimming the surface mm -hmm. or algae. Duckweed, which is a totally different uh, chemical and uh, physical features than. So than I have to ask you one question that I've always pondered being in the zoo world. You know, I was taught that oak is toxic. Mm -hmm. uh, renal toxic causes kidney problems. Every part of it, the bark, the leaves, the nuts, even the root material. So how is it that I see and watch my, my, my uh, you know, rhinos and my, um, uh, the big ones, the giraffes sitting there grazing on oak trees all the time and never seem to have problems? Well, as with anything, quantity is the, is the key. So small amounts, and if their guts and the microbes are adapted for some of those toxins, they can detoxify them. Oh, very I mean, some of the best pork in the world is raised on acorns. Really? Yeah, so, so oh. there, are, there are ways that these animals have evolved to deal with different kinds of foods. Well, we're going to take another break, <laughs> our final break before our close-up session. And again... Dr. Ellen Dierenfeld, our comparative uh, nutritionist, and my wonderful co-host, 
Cindy Vickers and Dr. Doug Pernikoff. And Dr. we're young. Doug's we're so, so all things very, animal. very young. Here we are. All Things Animal Radio Show. We'll be back in just a moment for a recap. Thank you. Welcome back, folks. We're in our final segment of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. Cindy and I have been interviewing Dr. Ellen Dierenfeld, who's an amazing person. And I just want to thank you, Ellen, uh, for being here with us and talking about a lot of your stories. But we have so much more. We'll have to have you back for that. And what was the most important word you learned today, Cindy? <laughs> um, Go ahead. You oh, can say Oh, they it. just put me right on the spot. And I can't think of one. No, masticate, I knew. Oh, okay. Ruminate. Yeah. But I like that. Uh, ruminate. Ruminate. A ruminator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's not ruminate. Right. A ruminant. <laughs> oh, apparently, <laughs> I did not ruminate. learn it. <laughs> that ruminates. <laughs> so you're right. But the but the the cavity that the food goes in, where and the, and where it gets uh, scrubbed, churned up is the rumen. I uh, learned that. Right. And they're right. a ruminant. Okay, I know now. Oh my God, you're so bright and so Yeah, intuitive. right. Okay. I did want to ask. Uh, so Ellen also travels all over the world doing consulting research and goodies like this and where are you going next i'm actually headed out this weekend to seoul south korea there's wow. a nutrition conference at the zoo there i've uh, consulted for them before it's actually the largest zoo in the world is it, it really is bigger seoul. than um i always thought the one in um lost it again indiana i mean uh, indonesia down in singapore i thought the singapore zoo was monstrous yeah this one's bigger really wow yeah. very yeah. interesting let's go I know what we should do. We should. Can we do the show at distance, I wonder? Yeah. Okay, that'd be great. On our cell phones, could that work? Uh, that could work. I've done, actually, I did one um, interview show about, uh, I was in, um, uh, where the heck was I? Well, I, <laughs> I'm really having some problems. Who would know? <laughs> I better take my anti uh so you were in Antarctica. Medicine. No, no, I was in. Okay, uh, uh, you were in Greenland. No, it was in. Um, New Jersey. Begins with a P. You're in Pittsburgh. No, it's down in. Peru. No. Pop Papua or whatever is New, New Guinea. Guinea. No, no, not that far. Okay. You're in Portugal. It was really a Portugal. good trip. <laughs> it was a great okay, trip. We can keep going with peas because we have more. But I did a show in the middle of a tea plantation in Panama. Panama. Oh, Panama. And oh. it was a live show. Ding, ding, ding. And I was up on a mountain on my cell phone, and it worked actually quite well. Oh, cool. Well, but, yeah. okay. So, Ellen, we can Note always get self. you. <laughs> anyway, I just want to thank you for being here. It's great. I learned a lot, and I got a lot more to learn. And, Cindy, I think you enjoyed it, too. You oh, I loved some it. New big I loved words it. I'd you can love use. for you to come back. Will you? S <laughs> you can go home and talk to your kids and everything. No, like I that. sign things here. And you're like, Ruminator. what's that about? Ruminator. <laughs> I don't know how to sign a ruminant. I have to figure that one out. It's been a great show, and I appreciate everybody coming. If you're looking for training support, Cindy Vickers is amazing. You can call her at our clinic at 636-530-1808, which is the same number, 636-530-1808, where you can reach me at the Clarkson Wilson Veterinary Clinic. And we'll be back next week with another special guest and another special topic. See you all later. Bye-bye. Adventure with wishbone on the trail. Come on, wishbone.